Dr. Kim Yong, Minister of Health, Dr. Moffat, Dr. Siletan. Welcome to all of you. Before I start, and in fact, I think you saw, where's my slide? I think you saw, <laughs> I think you saw a little bit of entertainment before. <laughs> it wasn't meant to be, but last night, when I had the, uh, when I was waiting to go for dinner with uh, the WCPD group, um, I was actually talking to Professor Uchiyama, who's in the audience somewhere. He's the Vice President of the Japanese Physical Therapy Association. And he asked me, do I consider myself Singaporean or Japanese? <laughs> and I didn't give him a very good answer at that, at that time. And I've thought about it the whole day, and uh, I would like to do that now. <laughs> Some of you may know I'm, I've been living in Japan for about 20 years in a, in a region where it's really, really cold, lots of snow. So when I come back here, I sweat profusely. So if I even have a fan in my chair, everybody knows that I go, go wrong with a fan. And my body is slowly turning Japanese. <laughs> but my, my mind, well, I was educated in Singapore, and I, was, I did my physio in New Zealand, Auckland, my postgrad in Australia, so my mind's a bit like British Commonwealth <laughs> in there. And my mind controls my body, but my heart controls my mind. And most of you know, I'm married to a Japanese, so that trumps everything. <laughs> but not quite, <laughs> because if you look at the side profile, my stomach is 100% Singaporean because <laughs> I've been doing nothing but eating local food for the last few days and I've really, really been putting on weight. So, so there you go. Personal identity is all a matter of perspective. It's a matter of where you, which perspective you choose. And I'm going to come back to this again in the, in the lecture today and talk about professional identity. And as you heard from Marilyn, we have 111 member countries. So we're looking at 111 perspectives of the physical therapy profession. Every single one of that is a valid perspective. It's different, but it's valid. And I would encourage all of you over the next three days to make friends, talk to each other, and perhaps you begin to understand the diversity of the physical, uh, physical therapy profession and although we are, we are joined by the same definition, the practice in education and governance would be very different. And, but nonetheless, that I would like to thank WCBT for uh, inviting me to be the keynote. Most of you would not have heard about me, but some of you who I've been working with, trying to get a subgroup for electrophysical agents, would probably know me a bit better. So when I thought, when they wanted me to do the keynote, I thought here was a chance to talk about electrophysical agents. <laughs> but unfortunately, they gave me 15 minutes, so that's not gonna happen. And they said to make it a bit more entertaining, and that's, <laughs> EPA is far from entertaining. <laughs> so, so, so to those of you anyway, who are expecting me to do that, I really, really apologize. But, <laughs> but nevertheless, after the initial disappointment had subsided, and after months of scientific research, <laughs> I finally came to a well, reasonably exciting topic. And I think Ms. Minister Gunn had preempted me a little bit in that as well, to look at technology and how it affects the profession, the future of the profession. Now, so let me just very quickly start with the WCPD map. There are 111 member organizations. And as I told you earlier on, depending on which perspective you choose, you will find that although we are different in many ways, we share one common identity. And I want to talk to you a little bit more about that. This is the 17th Congress, the fourth time it is in the Asia Western Pacific region. And as you heard again earlier, the second time in Asia. Japan being the first. 
So welcome back to Asia, a region that you will find that is very diverse in its governance, in its education, and its practice. But I suppose it's not just in Asia, in all the rest of the world as well, you will probably find differences, and all of you probably would be talking about that, I hope, for the, last, for the next few days. But no matter how different we are, and no matter at what stage of development we are, technology offers an opportunity for you to leapfrog in your development, because technology tends to have a multiplier effect. And if you choose to use it properly, I think you will find that you don't have to go through the process one by one, you can actually accelerate your development if you choose to use it properly. Now, very quickly, all of you know this is the definition of physical therapy. It's movement. We are movement scientists, and we look at mobility. And <clears throat> Dr. Salman, in this issue, argues that the human movement system should be our professional identity. If you have not read this, I would certainly recommend that you read this on your flight home. <laughs> And you know that mobility requires, the minimum requires you to be able to sit, to lift yourself off the chair, to stand, to take the initial step, and then hopefully progress to walking. The minimum level of mobility would be the ability to sit in a wheelchair. And the biopsychosocial model reflects or emphasizes this mobility function that we, we seek in our patient. So all of you probably would be familiar with trying to train someone to use a wheelchair, trying to train someone to stand up from a wheelchair, trying to get them to do a stepping, and finally to get them to walk. Now, I'm coming back to this again and again and again, the sitting, the lifting off, the standing, the stepping, and the walking. And the reason I'm doing this is now to try and show you how technology can change all that and perhaps even change the way that we view our profession or at least our professional identity. When I left for Japan 20 years ago from Singapore, I was really, really excited because Japan is always known as a country where it has advanced technology. And I thought, well, being a tech geek, I thought that would be a wonderful place to go and live and work. I wasn't disappointed from the super fast bullet trains to the humble toilet. <laughs> the first time I used this, I started to realize just how unprepared I was as a user of advanced technology. <laughs> after finishing, you know, after doing what I wanted to do there, I had to look for the flush button, which is here. But being given so many choices <laughs> and wanting to get out as fast as I can, I ended up pressing here. So, which, by your laughter, you probably would know that it just resulted in my, the front of my pants being wet. But I wasn't the only one that was, uh, because I found out through the internet that some people actually use it to rinse their hands <laughs> and even brush their teeth. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend that you do that, but at least I wasn't as bad as that. Now, Having got used to this technology and having used it for so long, I find that when I travel overseas, <coughs> I really, really miss my toilet. <laughs> and I can't wait to get back to that. Well, fortunately, with today's technology, mobile technology, you don't have to leave home without it. Now, all that's coming to this slide that says that there is no doubt technology is progressing at the exponential phase, especially over the last few decades. It's, it's, if you look at the slide alone, and it's just gonna go up even more, that we cannot but help to have this conversation about technology 
now. And, and I think Singapore, Asia, Japan, and so on will be a good place to start. The physical therapy, recent issue of physical therapy actually has a very good issue that focuses on innovative technologies in rehab. Again, if you can download this and read this on your flight home, I think you'll, you'll be impressed by the papers there. So, if you can imagine, some of you have seen this before, robots, well, that vacuum your floor, effortlessly, with a mind of their own, they can navigate corners, small spaces, and so on. If you can combine that with a wheelchair, for indoor mobility, where you need something small, portable, that can navigate tight spaces of, and corners, for example, that would be something that a patient with severe mobility impairment at home, they would be able to use. There's supposed to be a sound with it. Yes, I can. You can only go at your will, the world's first. Normally, you move front and back like a normal wheel. The outer wheel is actually made up of lots of other wheels, placed laterally, so it can move side to side as well. Let's give it a go. And it uses your upper body movement to choose it where you want to go. So you can go right, or left, backwards, or forwards. You can turn around, and go for right. This is the Honda U3X. Now, the wheelchair has also been given a technology update. Wheel is the next generation of personal mobility device that offers both function and design. My name is Siki, the CEO and co-founder of Wheel. Wheel has two core competitions. The first one is the design. The second one is the maneuverability. So we invented a special front wheel. It composed 24 small rollers. It can make it very tight tiny radius for inside use. And also, this is four wheel drive. It can cover on the snow, pebble, any chain you can go. Unlike other devices that are more cumbersome and larger, the wheel is compact, agile, and intuitive. Operation is very simple. but you're not quite able to stand up fully or take a step. Body weight support. It's a bit more complicated. You've got to take your shoes off, and then put your feet inside. These are special shoes that attach to the device. Give me a moment. Do the zips up. Elastic. These stand up, one hand on the front, and one hand on the back. Lift up to your crotch, and you have a nice big codpiece. Anyway, when you step off, you're walking. Looking a bit like an ostrich. Oh. As you can see, that helps me climb the stairs very elegantly. <laughs> and then if you stop, you've got to crouch down. Do something quite hard. This is some supports you really nicely here. You've got comfort. It really takes the weight off your legs. And if you can stand, but not quite able to take steps, for example. So, サイバニックスギーツの一つの研究成果の一つに過ぎないです。例えば、その、え、体に運動機能に障害を持った方、こういった方が使うことによって、春がそういったその障害の部分を補っていくことが可能となります。例えば、体の動きが悪くて、例え
So though it doesn't make you run faster by Usain Bolt, it still helps them take longer strides. So even in their 80s and 90s, they can keep walking around. Now, no matter what your activity level is, to get around within the community, you would still need to at least get yourself into a car and get somebody to drive you, or if you drive yourself, for example, <coughs> transferring from your car to after your wheelchair, sorry, to your car, can be a simple thing if you have something portable like the U3X, for example, just roll up, bring it in. And then you can, with today's driverless car technology, for example, you can either drive yourself or you can let the car drive you to wherever you want to go, drop you off at the entrance. You can then get out of there, transfer to your again personal mobility device, and after that you can activate the car's self-parking software. And this will instruct the car <coughs> to find a parking spot anywhere and to park by itself. And when you're done, you can actually do the same thing, reverse, activate the car to come to the main entrance to pick you up, transfer into the car, and then off you go, you can go home. So to those of you who are old enough like me, this sort of brings back memories of this TV program that we use, we all used to go up. <laughs> so it's a little bit like life imitating art. Now, apart, oh sorry, before I come to this, a lot of what you see today, especially the health suit and the uh, uh, stride management assist, for example, and the body weight support devices, you will see presentations from physical therapists from Japan, Europe, and so on, um, under, I think it's a technology and robotics session. So if you have time, if you want to find out more, go and talk to these researchers. They're not something that is in the future, they're actually here and now, and people are using it and doing research on it at the moment. Now, in addition to the mobility technology, there are other types of devices, which I won't have time to go into. But very quickly, just wearable technology, 3D printer, for example, and that's more. Now, to finish off, the biopsychosocial model, I've always assumed it goes from left to right. So, if a medical doctor can treat the disease or the impairment, for example, then there will be very little impact on quality of life. Similarly, if the physical therapist treats the impairment and the activity limitation, again, quality of life will not be affected. And of course, if you treat the activity limitation and participation restriction, then again, nothing will affect the quality of life. This is how we assume. But you can see that by using technology, for example, to actually remove barriers in activity limitation and participation restriction, you find that this can actually turn the whole model on its head. In fact, it might even, you can even argue that it makes the focus on impairment and pathology almost unnecessary to some extent. Not for all, but for some. Now, fortunately anyway, by coincidence, WCPT is having a futures forum tomorrow where we hope that the conversation on technology will continue in this Congress. But as most of you would know, any conversation on technology must involve the young physical therapists because anyone with young children would identify with this. The young children and young physical therapists instantly, almost instinctively, they have an affinity for technology. They're not afraid of that compared to not so young physical therapists like ourselves. So I would encourage that when we're having this dialogue on technology, that we really look at how the young physical therapists can shape the future of the profession by, well, at least by discussing how we can use technology in a way that will help to shape our practice, our research, 
and our education. Thank you very much. Distinguished guests, delegates, colleagues, and friends. Um, I'm Amy Stewart, uh, the chair of the International Scientific Committee, and I think that I get to do all the fun things this evening. And certainly, my first very <coughs> pleasurable task is to thank Prof. Cheng for that really entertaining talk. I think that he gave us a glimpse of technology that, in the way it can be used now, and certainly into the future, and I think he gave us a lot to think about. Not only was it a fascinating talk, but it was certainly entertaining, and I think that you can see what a totally delightful individual Prof Chang is, so thank you very much. My second task, my second delightful task this evening is to introduce